What's up, everybody? Thralls Metal here once again. I'm the Croc Neck. I'm Jamin' John. And we have an album review for you, and uh, one that I've definitely had uh, on my radar for a while since I saw this band sign with 20 bucks, Ben. We are going to go over the latest offering from Sivorous, Maze Envy. This comes out on the 22nd of March, again on 20 Bucks Spin Records. This band formed in LA in 2019. This is their second album. First one on 20 Bucks Spin, I do have their debut album, Decrepit Flesh Relic, which was absolutely awesome. And it was kind of difficult to figure out who the band was because they have one of the most illegible logos I've seen in a <laughs> while. Like it's all thorns, horns, and whatever in there. Uh, I thought it began with an E for a while. Yeah. It wasn't until someone told me <laughs> in the comments, like, it's it's Severus. It's like, geez, how the hell did you make that out? Yeah, I was looking at it. We had the YouTube stream going, and I, even staring at it, like, knowing full well what it was, I was like, I can kind of see it, I guess, but I don't, it's not, it's, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> but it's awesome looking. And the album cover is sick. Yeah. Uh, so... All right, at least on the archives, this band is described as blackened death metal. Uh, that is partially true. I would say, like, death metal is kind of the central sound, but there are elements of, like, death doom on here, as well as some surprises I really didn't see coming. And that honestly starts with the intro track, The Azure Eye. Uh, first off, it, it kind of starts off with this kind of, you know, dull sort of humming noise. I thought it was my tinnitus. But uh, as it goes on, I started hearing like fluttering strings. And honestly, I kind of like this intro. And this is coming from the guy that bitches about every intro. <laughs> but I like it because it kind of captures that horror setting, but in a different yeah. sense. Yeah. Like, this is more classic sounding. Like, the opening credits to a Vincent Price movie rather than a Fulci movie. It reminded me very much of the opening of like old black and white films, like more so like kind of creepy old black and white films, just very 30s, 20s type of just fluttering strings, like real quick trills. Very night on bald mountain, uh, courtesy of Fantasia, the whole uh, Chernobog thing. That's fair. But I thought that was a really interesting setup and then you get into Shrouded in Crystals and Man. This thing is heavy, dense. The guitar tone is just massive it on here. It snarls. It's filthy. It's grimy. It's crunchy. But like, there's a there's a, just a buzz to it the whole time. And the bass is the same way. Big, nasty, filthy, dissonant chugs right off the bat. Like instantly, I'm like, all right, cool, I'm in. It it did a chug and it was dissonant. That yeah. makes Jam and John a happy boy. Yeah, I was I was very happy. And this was kind of what I expected from the band because the first album kind of runs the same way. Like, it is just heavy and lumbering. You get intermittent spots of, uh, I guess, black metal. It's more, I don't know, like atmospheric death metal, I guess. Uh, like, Labyrinth Chasm has a very distinct, like, black metal tremolo oh, section. Yeah. But it almost comes across as more shoegazy than like, you know, like Sinister Second Wave Black Metal. And with their absolutely heavy, thick tone, I know it, it kind of gives it a more spacious sound because this album loves reverb. It's very just huge sounding, like the drums are absolutely booming on here. Yeah. And as he brought up about the guitars and bass, like they're both heavier than hell. Like I swear the guitar strings sound like they're thick as a telephone pole. And then more about the drums. First of all, the drums are fat and punchy. That snare's got a real big thwack to it. The kick drums sound very natural, yet they've got this nasty thump to the kick drum. Lots of great accent work and a lot of off-time rhythms. Uh, Labyrinth Charm and Levitation Tomb both feature moments of definite, like, off-time polyrhythms, as well as syncopated grooves, but stuff that would be more akin to, like, Meshuggah. Yeah, the end of uh, Levitation Tune, there's a syncopated chug that, I mean, it, it sounds like Meshuggah. And all throughout the album, like, these little off-time hitches, like, you'll get a beat that has, like, a weird hitch in it all of a sudden. Labyrinth Charm has a blast beat section with a, like, distinct stop-start little motif. And it's these little sort of hitches that kind of keep you a little off-kilter. But also, it's really cool to see how those play with the riff work, because the riff work is very fluid. And yeah. by fluid, I mean, like... 
snot, like, you know, thick runny snot. <laughs> it's, it's like a gross fluid for damn sure, but like there's constantly like these big bending, lurching, crawling riffs all over the place, but how they play off of the drum accents, I think gives this album like a very, I don't know, just sort of an interesting vibe. Amongst all the syncopated riffs, and there are a ton of riffs in this album, oh, and very yeah, good yeah. ones for that matter, but a lot of times, too, they rely on not only the atmosphere, but these big, like, single chugs, and it's the way that the drums kind of weave in and out of these single chugs that make it more entertaining, whereas if the guy would have stayed in the pocket the whole time, I think it would have changed the overall vibe of a majority of this record. The drummer does really well to both play in the pocket and play polyrhythms with these mostly like simplistic chugs that appear throughout this record too, and it gives it just a, a, a great flair. Yeah, and on top of these big bottom heavy chugs, like sometimes they are doubled up, but often you get like a lot of ambient atmosphere on top of them. You get like some chiney melodies, some really interesting clean guitar play on here. Both Labyrinth Charm and Levitation Tomb, as well as the last track, Garyon the Plummet, make great use of just open, clean, very chimey, haunting tones. And on top of that, you have these massive vocals. Like the first roar on this album, it sounds like King Kong clearing his throat. Like yeah. it is just massive. They are not too cavernous. There's like the appropriate amount of reverb on there to make them sound more full, but not sound like they're echoing through a cave or a tomb. And there's frequently a kind of give and take between like more blackened vocals mm -hmm. and these deep death metal roars. So you get a lot of cool vocal dynamics. But a lot of this, I think, really opens up towards the back half of this album. And this is where some of the surprises come in. The opening track, the Azure Eye, you know, with the strings and all, I thought that was a cool, like, opening touch. Like, all right, I did not expect that yeah. to repeat. And throughout the album, there's lots of lush synths that sit, you know, a little bit further back in the mix, but yeah. add a haunting sort of atmosphere to the album. But as the album goes on, you start hearing the strings again, and they add a lot. There's a particular kind of misery that strings add versus synths. Like, mm -hmm. synths are like, all right, you know, that sounds sad or it sounds spooky. Like, I get it. You love Fulci movies. That's awesome. Right. But strings kind of have, like, a gothic dreariness to them. And hearing that sort of woven in with a band that kind of sounds, I mean, similar to, like, Outer Heaven, Two Mold, uh, nothingness, definitely Morbid Angel. Yep. Oh yeah. It's really interesting to see how that weaves in. It adds kind of like an Alfred Hitchcock kind of vibe. A little bit. Just, just like not so not full blown, you know, Fulci horror, but just kind of like oh, oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's Janet Leigh driving at night on a yep. dusty highway. Ooh, look, a motel. I'm sure nothing bad will happen there. I'm gonna stop there and take a shower. But then you get to the last two songs on the record, and these two songs make up pretty much half of the album. Both of these songs are gigantic, over like nine and a half minutes a piece. And something you wanna do when you have really big songs, and this band does so well, Doom. Maze Envy starts out with this dissonant, grimy, nasty, snarling melody, and then Doom. To me, it reminded me a lot of Primitive Man, at least vocally. Like, when he gets those deep roars, it reminds me of Ethan from Primitive Man. Yeah, uh, this song, I mean, I really wasn't expecting Death Doom, even though it kind of leads in with the Death Doom breakdown on Shrouded and Crystals. You know, this band has always had, like, a little bit more of, like, a hefty groove to them and, you know, slow it down a bit, but they never really came across as Death Doom. These last two songs have some flat out death doom moments and hearing these songs sort of weave their way between like old school death metal death doom a little bit more of that kind of shoegazy black metal the dynamics on the title track are just absolutely on point that song goes kind of all over the place uh, you get some like more technical you know complex riffing in there there's a clean moment where everything drops out outside of a single the very chimey guitar yeah. and it builds back in with just blast beats and tremolos and like more cold riffs and then the end of it is a big death doom breakdown with strings and synths in the background mm -hmm. and this initially is where i kind of got a vibe like man that kind of sounds like my dying bride a bit but <laughs> when you get down to the last track uh gary on the plummet man the plummet is real it is long <laughs> it is slow 
It is cold and will last you the rest of your life. <laughs> um, this song is absolutely bleak, and it is, it's a flat-out funeral doom song. Yeah. It sounds like My Dying Bride. It is slow, droning, miserable. The strings on this song. Oh, my God. My Dying Bride, I've always prided in the fact that they already play just massively doomy, depressing music. If a band could be the mayor of a town, then My Dying Bride would be the mayor of Bummerville. And a big reason for that is because they added strings, because it makes already depressing, <laughs> glum, melancholic atmosphere even more depressing. Yeah, like I straight ripped my heart out, threw it on the floor, and then pissed on it. I mean, it just... You're no good to me anymore. Yeah, it was... It, it's something else. The beginning of that song in particular is like being stuck in a gray room where the only thing in it is a TV playing an endless loop of Artex dying in the never-ending story. Which, if you're a child from the 80s, or just have seen that movie, you know that not much else gets as sad as that scene. I, I, I need a minute. <laughs> Or Littlefoot's mom dying, you know, that's up there too. Or, or uh, Old Yeller dying, yeah. or the end of the movie Click, or the Green Mile when he... Oh, man. All the sad things ever. That is the very start of this song, and it slowly progresses its way out of that. It starts getting a little bit more towards the death metal side, like even when the tremolo comes in, it kind of maintains mm -hmm. that slow, lumbering pace. It does pick up to blast beats, but... There's always that prevailing sadness. When everything drops out for that clean breakdown, it's like, just like, like wow, you found the most depressed chamber orchestra group to jam with. It's well, like, you guys just want to do a bummer jam and cry? Yeah, I mean, and, and part of that is because the strings never let up. Even when those blasts come in, there's still strings. Even when they, they get to the end, uh, where there's giant chugs, there's still strings. Like, they, they never let up on that atmosphere and that depressive melody ever throughout the whole song. But I think one of the coolest parts of that song, despite, like, I'd say about eight minutes of the nine and a half minutes of it are unbearably just depressing as hell, like... <laughs> It's it's like an esoteric song, and I mean, if you listen to esoteric, you know what they're about, too. Or even at its, like, heaviest and bleakest, like, spectral voice. Mm -hmm. But the end of it, it kind of starts getting bright. You get these soaring melodies, and what sounds like choirs in the background yeah. following the melody, and it's like it's pulling you out of the darkness. Like, hey, it's okay. Look, there's the sun. Stop bumming out. Why are you watching the never-ending story <laughs> like that? Why is it just that one scene? You right. need therapy. Right, and really... That all just kind of explains the production of this record. First of all, I think the production of this album is masterfully done. Done by Andrew Solis of uh, Apparition. Who also have an album coming out this week, which I'll definitely go over. Right, right, right. You know, for all this stuff to stand out, because the, it it's very layered when it comes to atmosphere, and it's very dense, but at the same time, you can hear most everything, especially the strings that lay behind everything. Like, they're just so crystal clear. Like, there's no denying that there's awesome string work going on. Yeah. Like, none. Like, and you can pick it apart from the synths, too. Like, you know, they do often harmonize with one another. Yep. But you can still pick out all the strings. Like, I think I even heard a cello and a viola in there. I could be wrong, but it sounded like you know, more than just a violin on here. And for the guitarists to be as big and as thick and as crunchy and heavy as they are, like, they don't overpower anything either. You can still differentiate the bass from the guitar. Like, they have two notable different tones. The drums, I think, sit perfectly in the mix. It's just a big, lavish production. It's cavernous, but it's not. It's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can agree with that. Like, generally, when I think of cavernous, I think about the vocals. And again, the vocals just have, like, that right amount yeah. of reverb on them where they have, like, more body to them, but they don't, again, come across as, like, just overly cavernous where by the time the next word comes in, it's like, I still think that first word is echoing right. through, like, right. every sewer drain out here. As far as any negatives on here... Is one that's just sort of a minor one, and it's more about the pacing of the album. After Shrouded in Crystals, you have Endless Symmetry, which is a really cool, you know, instrumental piece. It's more atmospheric guitars, and I kind of like how it sort of like weaves in between being almost pleasant to just downright unsettling. And while it does transition well into uh, Labyrinth mm -hmm, Charm, mm -hmm. 
I do feel like it comes a little too soon because it's the third track and you already had like a two minute intro, then an eight minute song, and then we're down to like another three minute transitional track. I feel like if that came a little bit later in the album, maybe that would have worked for me a bit more. It just feels, I don't know, like it's not quite in the right place, but at the same time, it doesn't feel intrusive. And this album's only a little bit over 40 minutes, so, you know, it's you know not too long per se, but it's just where that was placed. But that's kind of the only thing that really, I don't know, like put me off ever so slightly, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it did a little bit for me too. I thought, again, like you said, I thought it was a little bit too soon. But then again, listening to the rest of this album, I'm not sure where you would have put that otherwise. I think if you would have put it after Levitation Tomb, I don't know that Maze Envy would have hit as hard as it did. It's a cool track and I think it does work better to lead into Labyrinth Charm. But then again, you know, you have the Azure Eye in the beginning and, you know, having those two things in there, for me, didn't really kill it. It was just a kind of like, eh, I don't know. Overall though, I'm gonna give this record four and a half stars. I loved it. I love Chugs and Distance and everybody knows that, but the darkness of this album and the overall musicality, like I didn't expect there to be so much melody and that was another thing too we didn't really talk about. The melody when it hits is bright, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense considering how dark everything else is, but it's a nice contrast at the same time. The songs flow nice, the transitions are great. Again, the use of the strings, I think, is just a, a nice touch. You don't see bands do that often unless you're Wolves in the Throne Room or... Uh, My Dying Bride. My Dying Bride <laughs> or, you know, like, Leprous or something. But it just fit overall, making this whole thing emotional as well as dark and heavy. Dude, when it's heavy, it is heavy. Tons of stank-faced grooves, tons of grimy chugs, tons of awesome riffs. I will probably be listening to this a lot. If you're a fan of... Cosmic Putrefaction, Fossilization, Yaucha, Phobophilic, Morbid Angel, Incantation, Meshuggah, Teeth. Um, yeah, check this out. I, again, I love it. I'm going to go with a four and a solid one that could possibly grow to a four and a half in time. I really dig this. And this definitely expands on their sound from the first one by a lot. I think there's some absolutely amazing songs in here, namely the last two. The last two Oof. absolutely amazed me, but uh, Gary on The Plummet, man. Ah, that that is just kind of everything I love about, like, Death Doom and just Funeral Doom in general. Like, it reminded me of a Mournful Congregation song. Ooh. Bleak and sad, but at the same time, this whole album kind of runs a gamut of different motions. There's some proggy flavors here and there, and, I mean, if you just want, like, blunt force trauma riffing, there's plenty of that on here, too. The production is absolutely amazing. And once again, I gotta cite the drum work. The drum work, yeah. I think, really just sort of yeah. keeps this kind of a little off kilter in a good way. I love the weird off time transitions yep. and fills and just creative drum play all around. But man, like this is just a super heavy, dense album. Lots of comparisons you can make to like Outer Heaven, Two Mold, uh, Nothingness, for those that don't know that band. Nothingness, yeah. Definitely should. Yep. Yeah, I really dig this one. I'm looking forward to getting a copy, which uh, I can't remember if I pre ordered it or not. Uh, either way, I will get a copy because uh, this is absolutely awesome. And uh, whatever hype there is about this album, I would say it is justified. So, yep. Yep. yeah, check it out. So, if you enjoyed this review, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all, all the, the time. time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there's a link down below, thrallsmetal.com. Our Patreon link is there. It is also on our channel, up in the banner in the bottom right-hand corner. But if you're looking for Thralls Metal stuff, you have to go to thrallsmetal.com. We have new shirts. We have old shirts that are discounted, provided we have your size. We even have hats, too. So if you're looking for any stuff like that, click the link down below. As always, tons of stuff going on at Thralls of Metal between album reviews, which there are a ton of. We're only in March here, folks. Collection updates, discography rankings. We got Mashui coming up next. Just a, a ton of stuff going on. I think we're going to try to schedule a little interview hangout session here soon with some folks. You'll see. Anyway, we do all this stuff because of you guys. We genuinely appreciate you all who have shown up and continue to watch our videos and talk to us for whatever reason. I don't, I don't get it, but you guys do, and we appreciate that. We appreciate the support and the love. We can definitely feel it over here. Thralls of Metal has become a giant part of our lives. I can't believe this thing is as big as it is. It shocks me all the time. Nick That's what she said. <laughs>
Ah, sorry, I had to. I have the emotional maturity of a 14 year old. Anyway, yeah, uh, pretty much the same thing you said. You guys are absolutely awesome and uh, looking forward to overloading you guys with some more content. So one more big thank you because you're awesome and we will catch you later.